मैं दीपक और आमिर सर Thank you. Uh, so very good evening to everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Abhishek, and uh, I would like to welcome on behalf of Dr. Edis. And firstly, thank you very much to Dr. MBA sir for you know once again helping us design a wonderful agenda and this program. And I think um, I'll just like to say that you know, Dr. Redis has always been in forefront, uh, whether it is a beyond the bill activity or whether it is a pioneering efforts in hematology. I think uh, we are happy to share that uh, we have working on few good molecules, including oral ESA, mydostorin, and most importantly, CAR T also, both the BCM as well as CD19. And I think soon we will have this kind of portfolio and efforts. And uh, importantly, I think we will always try to support such kind of scientific activities, this being one of them. So I think that is all from my side. Uh, over to you, MBSR. Thank you, Mr. Abhishek. Uh, Roshni, my slide deck, yes. So, Good evening, friends. Today, the webinar is on myelodysplastic syndrome managing in 2021. This webinar is brought to you by Mumbai Hematology Group. It is supported by Dr. Redis, makers of uh, Darbe Poitin Cresp 500. 
and it is managed by my ideas i'm thankful to mr abhishek bhavsar and the team from dr reddys mr rajesh mr kalpesh and the team from my ideas the executive committee of mumbai hematology group dr ayaz ahmed moderator of the panel discussion panelists who are themselves eminent hematologists and medical oncologists and new participants for sparing your friday evening there will be a lecture on managing anemia in low risk mds present and beyond and this lecture will be given by myself this will be followed by panel discussion which will be on managing high risk mds that will be moderated by dr ayaz ahmed who is senior consultant hematology oncology and bone marrow transplantation department of hematology at rajiv gandhi cancer institute research center rohini new delhi the panelists include dr chiraksha director department of hematology and oncology apollo hospitals international ahmedabad dr subhaprakash sanyal consultant hematologist hematologist and transplant physician at fortis hospital mulund mumbai dr ramaswami nv senior consultant hematology in bmt ester med city kochi dr priyanka samal professor and head department of clinical hematology hematology and stem cell transplant at ims scm hospital bhubaneswar dr samir tulpure consultant hematologist hematology and bmt physician at kokila ben dhirubhai ambani hospital and medical research center andheri mumbai dr pavan kumar b consultant medical oncologist at indo american cancer hospital research institute hyderabad and lastly dr karuna kumar k consultant hematologist hematology oncologist bmt physician at yashoda hospitals secunderabad we have our chief guest with us today and that's dr dinesh burani dr dinesh burani is director department of hematology and bone marrow transplantation rajiv gandhi cancer institute at the center new delhi all of you know him but to complete the formalities He did his DM in clinical hematology from the prestigious CMC below, followed by FRCPA from Australia. He is the first DM in hematology from India. He received training and fellowship in bone marrow transplantation. He now has over 20 years of experience in stem cell transplantation, including allogeneic, autogenic, autologous, and MUD, as well as haplotransplants. He has completed over 1,000 transplants in Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute. He also performed the first haplotransplant in North India. In his numerous publications in international and national journals. Well, thank you so much for giving this opportunity to speak to you. And now over to our chief guest, Dr. Dinesh Bhrani, to address us. Good evening. Uh, am I audible? Good evening. Am you, I audible? You are. Yes. Okay. Uh, i'm thankful to intas and dr agrawal for giving me such a position in this uh, wonderful uh, seminar uh, i have been uh, many times uh, chief guest with dr agrawal's uh, many of the meetings so I, i i have run out of the all the encouraging words which he wants me to have it with you guys when someone who has attended many times probably would have had some repetition also uh this is a very good uh, initiative by intas and uh, dr agrawal to have a uh, covering the myelodysplastic syndrome treating in 2021 and uh, we have a very eminent uh, panelist and uh, moderator who is going to take you through this uh the only thing i want to say is uh, what counts in the life as a success is probably your relationship with your patient so how you are connected to your patient apart from uh, being up to date in your knowledge which usually is not probably is impossible to be considering uh, dr agrawal so many seminars webinars so you will be definitely updated in the knowledge but at the same time so apart from hard work and knowledge you need a connection with your patient so to be success in the field uh, which i think in especially in india uh we need a uh, how how much do you know about your patient uh, how much do you understand your patient's problem 
how much in depth you can connect with him uh, uh, being a part of uh, his decision making uh, addressing his concerns giving a time to him i think there are many factors uh, which makes you a good clinician you can have uh, all the degrees but you cannot be a good clinician unless you have uh, these kind of uh, uh, efforts you have to put in to, to go uh, go through this your uh, clinical life uh, we we can have a uh, many parameters of success you can have uh, how much money you earn how many numbers you have how many publications you have so there are various parameters but i think the the uh, as a clinician you will be satisfied if you if you have if you are considered as a good clinician in your field in your area and that also requires your uh, your connections with your patient so that's very important what we learn is uh, theory everything in the in the our all the trainings but we what we don't learn is uh, the how to connect with the patient so for that we need to put uh, your own efforts and uh, you have to find your way to get to there with this uh, i inaugurate this uh, webinar and i again thank dr agrawal to continue with this session so connect with the patient is the message dr dinesh gurani thank you very much that's a very very important message that you have given to our colleagues and at least i must follow this i will remember it forever thank you so much dinesh for being with us thank you sir and if you can spare some time be with us for as much i'm here no oh, good that's great thank you so much a little correction this webinar is supported by dr reddy's the image of abhishek with intas is so ingratiated <laughs> <laughs> i I'm i sorry. was thinking about that only i think varun <laughs> sir is just uh, uh, no i just messaged him <laughs> although <laughs> that's fine <laughs> that's in the mind depth of the brain so i i, I had to get this one out so moving word and uh, today i'm going to speak to you about managing anemia in low uh, low risk myelodysplastic syndrome and this webinar as i mentioned is brought to you by mumbai hematology group and dr reddy's i suppose i can change the slides right yeah thank you so mds is a chronic myeloid malignancy it's a disease of elderly ineffective erythropoiesis ineffective hematopoiesis leads to the cytopenia marrow is cellular and there is morphological dysplasia so these are very important components that you are a bit uncomfortable if you try to make this diagnosis in young people uh you are also uncomfortable if the counts are very good if you are uncomfortable if the marrow is not cellular and if you do not see any dysplasia in peripheral blood and the bone marrow so all these are essential component almost half of the patient will have cardiotypic abnormalities and over 80 to 90% i may say depending upon the quality of molecular studies available to you almost all may have molecular abnormalities from outside phenotypically mds may look similar however there are various heterogeneity of this particular syndrome adult versus pediatric primary versus secondary immune versus non immune low risk versus high risk de novo or relapsed patients and then there are entities like hypoplastic mds which i must say it's a it's a job to make a diagnosis MDS MPN syndrome and MDS with myelofibrosis risk stratification in MDS is one of the most important component the diagnosis prognosis and outcome of lower risk MDS is entirely different from that of higher risk so you have in each case understand the risk management in lower risk MDS because the survival as such is pretty long your job is to handle the cytopenia especially to make the patient transfusion free so that his quality of life is improved as against this in higher risk mds the life is at stake the patient has very short survival they very rapidly go into the aml and die and therefore goal is to prevent the evolution of disease to aml 
extend the life as much as possible and if possible cure for doing all this you have to have an accurate diagnosis and i must say this is one condition in the field of rheumatology and hematology oncology where wrong diagnosis is left and right i have not seen any other hematological condition which is more over diagnosed than mds and i must blame everybody for this the clinicians the pathologist and everyone who thinks that mds can be diagnosed single headed this is a clinical pathological diagnosis where from history to examination to blood counts to smear examination to bone marrow aspirate smear examination to bone marrow to fine biopsy to cardiotyping to molecular each component is extremely important and if you don't look at the body as a whole you will keep over diagnosing this condition i don't have time to go into this but one can talk for this for the whole day we come to the management and my job is to discuss the low risk mds and its management in next two slides i'll give you the summary of what the management of low risk mds can be if the patient is well preserved and the blood counts are well preserved you can wait and watch if the patient is symptomatic due to anemia obviously he requires transfusions you will like to make the patient transfusion free and on the top on the list is erythropoiesis stimulating agents and one of the most important in that is the darbepoint and often we link it up with gcsf and i'll come to that a little later if your platelets are bad you may bleed to death or it can produce morbidity you may use of tpo ra like altrombopag and romiflucid the second important drug is lenalidomide for a fraction of patient of mds but for them it's a targeted therapy it's the targeted therapy in the field of mds and then that group of hypoplastic mds or immune mediated mds they can be benefited with immunostimulatory agents like atg cyclosporine tacrolimus and others and as you move towards the higher risk maybe even a lower risk mds which is little bad type may be helped with hypomethylating agents to keep transfusion you need iron chelation and the blockbuster which should be soon available to you courtesy bms is loose better set i'm going to have few mcqs for you and this is my first mcq and i have given you eight option and you have to pick up a false statement deletion 5q is a disease of elder deletion 5q is more common in females deletion 5q presents with macrocytic anemia many patients with deletion 5q are transfusion dependent patients with deletion 5q have thrombocytopenia marrow shows megakaryocytes with a characteristic nuclear morphology this particular entity can be picked up on cardiotyping or fish lenalidomide for this is a targeted therapy with a success rate of 70% lasting for a median of the effect lasting the success lasting for a median of 1 and 1/2 to 2 years pick up the false statement your time starts now so here are the results thrombocytopenia is common is the answer and you are on the dot so we move to the next slide these people do not have thrombocytopenia they have thrombocytosis so you picked up the correct answer next one so we'll see a case now case is shobhana she came from kolkata in 2018 she had refractive macrocytic anemia for almost a year her platelet count was high 705000 she was transfusion dependent 
she had the characteristic megakaryocyte in the marrow, which was hypolobated with eccentrically placed nucleus, and there were almost no blasts. That's the characteristic meg with a eccentrically placed nucleus, which is hypolobated. Karyotyping showed deletion 5q. And the same was confirmed on the fish studies. As you see the two red dot here in a normal person, only one in this. So elderly female, macrocytic anemia, thrombocytosis, marrow resembling erythroid hypoplasia, characteristic make low risk of progression to leukemia, relatively better prognosis and having a targeted therapy are the findings in deletion 5Q syndrome. And this, as, you, as I mentioned, as a targeted therapy discovered by Ellen List. And this was the publication 16 years ago, lenalidomide targeted therapy for this particular MDS. As you know, lenalidomide available as capsule, when used in these patients, 67% of patients become transfusion free, but 33% of patients do not respond. So one third of the patients do not respond. Is this just your luck? Who responds and who does not respond? The answer is no. Gulam Mufti by molecular studies showed that MDS have 40 plus mutated genes. And one of the gene is TP53, which can be mutated in good number of patients. And if your patient is TP53 positive or mutated, then these are the patients who do not respond to lenalidomide. So you've got deletion 5Q alone, wonderful response. But if there is associated TP53 mutation or complex cytogenetics, then you do not respond. And that's his publication in 2011, TP53 mutation, low risk MDS with five deletion 5Q predict the prognosis. Lesson learned, make a diagnosis of deletion 5Q in a patient who comes to you for a refractory macrocytic anemia, elderly women, do karyotyping, do fish study, look for this finding. If it's negative, do NGS. LEN will be the targeted therapy with two out of three responding. Well, TP53 mutation, if there, there'll be lead failure. If you do not have deletion 5Q, will you use LEN and will it work? And the answer is yes. LEN can work without deletion 5Q in 27% of patients. And we'll see a case, Mr. Narayanan, 73 year old coming from Cochin 2019, had low risk MDS with severe anemia. He was transfusion dependent. He did not have deletion 5Q. His EPO level was pretty high, so we could not think of using darbepoitin. He was transfusion dependent. He was given linolidomide. He became transfusion free and he has been transfusion free. Valeria Santini published this data in 2016 that linolidomide is effective even in the absence of deletion 5Q. Of course, in a small number of patients, that is 26.9%. I come to my second MCQ, and once again, you have to pick up the false statement. I'll give you seven statements. Darbe is an effective treatment for low risk MDS. If your EPO level is below 200, then it's a predictor of response to Darbe. Low transfusion requirement is another response predictor. Effective dose of Darbe is 100 microgram given once a month. Responses occur within two to three months of starting Darbe. Responses can improve by adding GCSM. If lenalidomide fails, addition of Darbe to LEN can rescue 15 to 20% of patients. Your time starts now to pick up the false tip. So, effective dose of Darve is 100 microgram has been voted by almost 40% of you and you are bang on the dot. This is absolutely an ineffective dose of Darve as we will soon see. So, we move on and we go to the next case. 
that's mr patil 69 year old from kolapur he came for anemia of 6 months he was virtually incapacitated he had associated comorbidities his hemoglobin with transfusion was 8.9 and he had received six bags already in last six months his final diagnosis was mds ra there was no deletion 5q and his epo level was only 80 he was a perfect case to give esa as his epo level was low his transfusion requirement was low we gave him the standard dose of darbe that is cresp 500 microgram subcutaneously every 3 weeks and that's the correct statement and not like what i asked you in the mcq 500 once every 3 weeks subcutaneously the hemoglobin went up to 9.6 by 2 months and to 11.3 by the third month he became asymptomatic free from transfusion now he is enjoying outdoor activity socializing and can go to his club he is now with us for last 2 years his last hemoglobin is 12.8 and we have reduced the dose of darbe now to 500 microgram once a month so discussing about esa you got darbe poitin and you got erythropoietin are there response predictors yes lower the level of sepo better the response if the epo levels are above 500 which is very rare in this particular group of patients then darbe may not work lower the blood requirement better the response starting darbe very early in the course of the disease is an important aspect those who do not have 5q minus do better if there are two or less mutations they do better if there are no ring sideroblasts and there is no sf3b1 then they do better response occurs after or within 2 to 3 months so if you start darbe please persist for 2 to 3 months response is seen in about 20 to 40% of patient the dose as i mentioned was 500 microgram subcutaneously once in 2 to 3 weeks if there is inadequate response add gcsf and another 10 to 20% of patients will respond this is the graph showing your response versus no response quality of life significantly improves and if you do want to do further reading you have this is the master of uh, use of esa in mds phase 3 randomized placebo control trial of darbe in anemia of low risk mds published in leukemia 2017 and uh, genesa gave the details of good results with darbe dosed every 3 weeks 500 every 3 weeks this is darbe 500 every 3 weeks alone or with peg gcsf in low risk mds and that's in bgh clinical efficacy and safety of esa in both low and intermediate one risk mds review published 2 years ago and this is specifically of darbe published 5 years ago that's esa significantly delaying the onset of regular transfusion in low risk mds so even if a patient is transfusion free but is anemic you can significantly delay the blood requirement by starting darbe and that's dr reddy's crest darbe 500 microgram pre filled syringe which helps you to administer it every 3 weeks even patient himself can administer our experience is of more than 100 patients by now indication was symptomatic anemia none of the patient was totally transfusion dependent we used it early in the course in about 3/4 of the patient 98% of patient were low risk and they did not have deletion 5q 11 patients had deletion 5q but they had not responded to lenalidomide majority were low risk some were intermediate one the median hemoglobin was 8 median epo level was 136 karyotyping was normal in 34 fish panel was negative in majority and early use of epo was done in 23 and with gcs at 26 we saw good response with increment of hemoglobin of more than 2 g in 43% of patients the median time taken to response was 7 weeks and durability of response was almost 2 years and there were hardly any grade 3 4 adverse effects conclusion is darbe is a 
treatment for low risk MDS should be started early. Dose should be 500 once every three weeks. Response is occurring 30 to 70% of subjects. It should be continued for a minimum of eight weeks or even 12 weeks to see the response. Response can last for years. Adverse effects are very rare and it spares you of transfusion dependent life. Combination therapy. Can you combine LEN and ESA, that is LEN and DARBE in non deletion 5Q patients? This works in about 20% of patients. So if one of the two agent does not work, add DARBE to LEN or LEN to DARBE, and one fifth of the patient may respond. This is Nahida, 47 years old, from Hyderabad, seen about five years ago. Again, symptomatic with anemia, thrombocytopenia. She had hypoplastic MDS. Her EPO level was pretty high, and she had a PNH clone, small clone. Karyotyping showed eight trisomy, no deletion 5Q, and there was no SF3B1. So you've got a hypoplastic MDS patient. We gave her immunomodulation using horse ATG and cyclosporine. Three months later, she was transfusion free with excellent quality of life. This is a perfect case of low risk MDS to be treated like aplastic anemia with ATG and cyclosporine. Are there response predictor for immunomodulation? Yes. Younger patient, females, short duration of transfusion dependency, hypoplastic MDS, presence of trisomy 8, small PNH clone, HLA-DR15, absence of RARS, that is ring sideroblast, and absence of SF3B1 do better. I come to my last MCQ. Again, you have to pick up a false statement out of the six statements mentioned here. And this is all about loose better set. Loose better set is a transforming growth factor beta ligand trapping molecule. Loose petra sept is given by subcutaneous root. Loose petra sept is given once a week. Its dose is one milligram per kg and you can go up to 1.75 milligram per kg. It is most effective in patients of MDS with ring cetroblasts. SF3B1 is a mutation, which is a molecular marker to predict the success of loose petra sept. So pick up a false statement, your time starts now. So people have gone for C, that is uh, once every three weeks, uh, once every week is a wrong statement and you are absolutely on the dot again. So that was the false statement. You do not do it once every week. Ideal is, and the best protocol is to give it once every three weeks. So you got it correctly. So we will see our last case now. And that's Kiran Patel from Rajkot. Transfusion dependent anemia for four months. Hemoglobin was as low as six and it was macrocytic. He had normal chemistry. He had received injection B12 folic acid with no response. His transferrin saturation and ferritin were high. He had single lineage erythra dysplasia in the marrow and iron staining showed 6% ring sideroblasts. You could label it as MDS RARS because the number of ring sideroblasts were only 6%. Classical RARS is characterized by presence of over 15% ring sideroblasts in the marrow. And these are what are ring sideroblasts. In such patient, you should do molecular studies. And the molecule to be looked at is SF3B1 mutation. And this is that SF3B1 mutation, which is a splicing factor. So this is spliceosome mutation. It's a common mutation present in 15 to 30% of patients. It has a favorable prognosis. It is seen in 65% of patients with ring sideroblasts. And if this mutation is present, you can make a diagnosis of MDS RS even with 5% of ring sideroblasts. And as per WHO, MDS RS is now a molecularly defined entity. SF3B1 is present. Even if 5% of ring sideroblasts, you'll call the patient as MDS RS. These patients have fantastic survival. As you see over here, 
median survival is seven to eight years. And once again, if you have SF3B1 mutation, your survival is much better than other patients. The treatment of this entity is loose petrocyte, AAMT, available in the strength of 25 milligram and 75 milligram by name Reblozil, and it will be soon available to you in India. What it contains, it is loose petrocept, and that's its molecular structure. It is a transforming growth factor beta ligand trapping molecule. It targets the later stages of erythropoiesis. Darbe acts early, and this acts later. In fact, you can combine the two in your bad cases. It has a remarkable and durable effect on anemia of MDS with ring cytoplasm. It is given subcutaneously once every 21 days, and the dose is start with one milligram. If it does not work after two months, go to 1.33 milligram. And then if it does not work after two months, you can go to 1.75 milligram, which is a serine dose. And that's the two components of erythropoiesis. In the early part, Darbe is effective. In the later part, dose petrocept is effective. So this is the algorithm you have. If you have deletion 5Q, use lenalidomide. If you do not have deletion 5Q, you and patient is eligible for Darbe poetin, go for Darbe poetin, especially if your EPO level is less than 200. If not, then if you have an access to loose petrocept, use loose petrocept, especially in patients who are ring cytoplast or who have SF3B1 mutation. And then of course, out of failures, you can go to hypomethylating agents. US FDA approved loose petrocept AAMT for anemia of adults with MDS in April 2020. Evolving therapies, which we are not going to discuss today, include imetelstat, rigosertib, IDH inhibitors if you are IDH mutated, and the novel hypomethylating agents. Miscellaneous aspect of treatment is iron chelating agents in transfusion dependent low risk MDS, of course, blood support, antimicrobial prophylaxis, and growth factors. The message of my talk is. Low risk MDS management involves wait and watch if you can maintain your comes, transfusion support when the hemoglobin is symptomatically low, erythropoid stimulating agents, especially Darbe pointing when your endogenous level of erythropoietin is below 200 or even below 500. If Darbe alone does not work, link it up with GCSF. If platelets are bad, use thrombopoietin analogs. Deletion 5Q, use LEN. Hypoplastic MDS use ATG with cyclosporine. And if nothing works, try hypomethylating agents. Transfusion dependent use iron chelator and loose petrocept for SF3B1 mutation. So I suppose we have covered most of the aspects of low risk. Selection of treatment, individualization was very important. All the time you keep weighing what's going to work and what's not going to work. And Darbe 500 once in three weeks is a game changer for your low risk MDS. It may be an ancient treatment because it has been around for 10, 15 years, but old is gold. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity to me to speak to you. And that's the end of my talk. Uh, we can take away the slides. And what we will do is we will go to the panel discussion straight away. And it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Ayaz Ahmed, who has already been introduced to you, to conduct the panel, invite his panelists and go ahead. Over to Ayaz. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, just a minute, can I share my slides? So... Sure. Uh, I hope I am audible and uh, my screen is uh, visible. Yes. yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, thank you, sir, and uh, for giving me this uh, chance to moderate this session. So, I have kept both uh, one case of uh, low risk MDS and high risk MDS. So, to keep the discussion a little bit uh, on the both sides. 
So uh, I like to invite my panelists. Uh, uh, I, it has they have already been uh, introduced by sir. So uh, Dr. Chirag from um, Ahmedabad, Dr. Suprakash Sanyal from Mumbai, and uh, Dr. Ramaswamy from Kochi, Dr. Priyanka Samal from Bhuneshwar, Dr. Samir Tulpare from Mumbai, and Dr. Karuna from Sikandarabad. I think so. Everyone is there. Uh, Dr. So, Nayan, so, I think so far two are not there, Dr. Chirag and Dr. Pawan. Okay, 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 sir. Sure. So, uh, I'll uh, just start with the uh, case one. So, uh, after sir's talk, I I, I think uh, low risk MDS is uh, pretty been explained, but just few slides on this and uh, we'll take to the high risk case. So, first uh, uh, case is a 60 year old female with no comorbidities presented with worsening fatigue, lethargy since one year and uh, uh, sorry, she was being uh, given two packs cells every month and since last six months. Now, uh, evaluation when she presented to us has a hemoglobin of 7.8, TLC of 3150, with a platelet count of 4,55,000, MCV of 105, LFT, KFT, LDH was within normal limits, urine stool examination was normal, upper and lower GSCOPY normal, serum ferritin of 250, B12. Of uh, 260 folate levels more than 20, PNH was negative, DCT negative, ECG echo was normal. We did a bone marrow aspirate and biopsy that showed MDS RA with spring cytoplast. And cytogenetics reported was normal karyotype, serum EPO was asked, it was 80. And NGS was done in this case, it was SF3B1 mutation. So, uh, my question for the panelist uh, uh, is Dr. Pienka there? Can you yes. ask her? Dr. Diaz, I'm here. Yeah, sure. Uh, Dr. Diaz, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, sir has discussed. So, just on the brief note, uh, um, what, how you approach this case? Uh, it's a low risk MDS uh, as uh, given uh, uh, how you will take this case forward. Low risk MDS and uh, the patient is having a low equal level as already discussed, erythropoietin stimulating agents definitely are the first uh, drugs of choice over here. But uh, as already discussed, we are more comfortable giving with the dose, which is uh, 3 weekly once dosage, 500 micrograms. But previously, prior to the uh, availability of this CRESP uh, 500, we used to give the conventional EPO and the dosage is quite high, 60,000 to 80,000 per week. And I think with uh, this three weekly dosage, the cost has become also quite affordable and uh, the spacing is also good for the patients to take it at home and at three weeks in double. So the dosage in case lowest MDS, uh, ESAs are quite high, EPOs are conventional EPOs are quite high. Any, any particular concern while you are uh, prescribing this uh, Darby protein to your patients? Anything in the elderly, we are a little worried. Yeah, we are worried about if uh, the patient is having uh, 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 like uh, the hemoglobin level is approximately ten. I wouldn't like to prefer. I wouldn't like to start it because of the risk of the thrombosis or the hypertension, which are the side effects. But possibly I have not come across with such sort of side effects with this uh, uh, preparations. Sure. Thanks, Dr. Priyanka. Uh, Dr. Samir, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Uh, hi, 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 Samir. Uh, uh, Dr. Samir, uh, um, do you uh, say NGS, uh, uh, now that NGS is a new kid in the block for every disease, so in low-risk MDS, uh, do you, how do you take this in this, uh, the patient was as a 3B1 positive, so do you really, uh, how many patients do you uh, really take this uh, uh, NGS and NGS. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And how so usually uh, in our hospital, I think usually it really depends upon so a lot of factors. Age, uh, you know, affordability is a real issue as well. Although there are certain labs which would would be doing NGS at a much more uh, you know affordable rate. So I think all those factors do play in mind. But especially in young patients, you know, it's important to know what the you know molecular uh, profile is going to be because if they've got higher risk. Uh, you know, like ASXL1, DET2 and things like that, then we know that they're probably going to progress or we have to be slightly ready if they progress for a you know potential transplant. Uh, plus their survival would, you know, probably be dictated by what sort of mutations they have. So higher than mutations, lower would be their survival compared to either no mutations or just SF3 beta 1. 
So I think in selected patients, at least coming affordability, young patient, you know, those were the patients who would all probably uh, do the NGS. Sure. And uh, any uh, uh, specific for darbeputin you are using? Uh, as so again, to, both. The... Again, both. So because you know, Epo Alpha forty thousand compared to Darpo Darbeputin five hundred. You know, again, there's a cost differential there, but definitely depending on the level of hemoglobin, as she rightly said, more than uh, if it is around 10. Uh, but again, you know, if they're symptomatic or not symptomatic, what is the age? You know, if it is less than 10 and symptomatic, so it's really going to depend upon what the patient preference and preference patient selection is going to be at that particular point. So I've used both. I've used both Dabapoetin as well as uh, EPO. The BCSH guidelines, because there we, it is where we have trained. So what they have actually suggested is to use uh, 150 microgram per week or 300 every two weeks, uh, at least for eight weeks before moving up or doubling the dose for the next eight weeks. Uh, and if that doesn't respond, then adding the GCSF later on. For the sure. alpha, it is like you know, sort of 30 to 40,000, then double the dose up to sort of 60,000 for the next eight weeks, and then so on again with GCSF later on. So really we're talking of you know about you know 16 weeks before we add gcsf before we say that you know they have failed epo uh, so but in you know practically on the ground you know patients are probably not going to wait for sort of 16 weeks although as sir rightly said at least two to three months we have to allow epo to, to work so probably you know depending on the level of hemoglobin you know 500 is probably a sweet spot not too high not too low and the initial studies also showed uh, the same dose level being good effective. So it really depends upon uh, patient selection and... Uh, sure. Thanks, 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 Dr. Samir. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Dr. Ramaswamy, are you there? Dr. Ramaswamy, uh, is he yes. here? In the... Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, hi, hi. 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 Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, we have discussed this uh, uh, about this, uh, everybody's in favor. So. Uh, any differences when you use weekly versus three weekly Darby protein? Any yeah. specific so before going to that for the discussion purpose, in this particular case, there was a macrocytic anemia and also there were a thrombocytosis. So, uh, we clearly uh, uh, MDS fish panel so that we are not missing that MDS 5Q. So, that is the one thing, but of course, even if it is a MD5, MDS 5Q minus. Uh, still, there is a role of erythropoietin, especially when the levels are low. So definitely, even even with a, a definitive crude 5Q minus, also you can still try with the uh, uh, MDS uh, this erythropoietin stimulating agent. And uh, as uh, uh, Samir has clearly mentioned that uh, 300 for the cost factor. So probably I'll be using 200 alternative week in my practice. Uh, that was the one which we are using uh, in a routine way because 150 is not easily available to give it. So we will go for the 200 uh, every alternative week instead of 150 weekly or a 300 every th three weekly, something like that. So we will keep sure. it in the middle between 200 every alternative week. And of course, clearly said there is no doubt that 300 will be a very effective one so that we don't have to wait whether it is responding or not. So that is where the gray zone which is coming. But probably we can put it in this way that the level is less than 100. Probably you can start with a low dose. Minimum of a month, we should wait. Maximum of two to three months. Probably the second and second month, you can try to escalate the dosage if you are not feeling the response. Regarding the uh, ceiling of the dosage, 10 to 12, as we all know that because of the complications of the thrombogenicity. And again, depends upon the uh, patient, how far the patient is active in a day-to-day -day active. Is it a, just a retired man resting at home or is he going for the job and other things? And the energy level, what is he meant by his energy level for his routine activities will decide what is the things uh, on that yeah. aspect regarding whether to keep it as 10 or whether it is 11. It's an individual, what the patient wants and the makes him comfortable without the, the equal energy yeah. level of so, as he wants. A lot of, uh, so it's like uh, whether we go for ethroportin or single. So our uh, experience is more with the weekly, uh, three weekly, uh, not uh, many patients on three weekly, but yeah. Uh, today's after sir talks, yeah, we will try the three weekly and our reporting. We should be. So uh, I'll not go into the. This has all been co covered uh, by uh, sir. This is uh, Darby protein and low risk MDS. These are the risk factors combining with the uh, GCSF. The scoring system is there. If you have a score, uh, which response uh, 
uh, which group will uh, um, responds better and uh, this is with the serum you view uh, when if it is less than 100 and 500 this is with the other article okay now uh, this is the one which i asked about the ngs again in the prognostics the complex this is also covered by itself so coming to back to case one uh, she was started on darbiprotein alpha 500 microgram every three weeks to a robust thyroid response according to the modified international working group criteria and uh, her a transfusion independent for almost 18 months then again she presented to uh, clinic with darbo uh, while on darbo protein alpha and this time hemoglobin was 6.3 a repeat bone marrow was done and con uh, with the concerns of progressive disease and again it the bone marrow showed uh, erythroid uh, dysplasia with ring cytoblast but now with this fiq cytogenetic abnormality so uh, i'll just uh, rope in dr sanya are you there yeah Uh, yeah so you know how you will manage what's your role with this lenalidomide and uh, either you will combine with esa and uh, uh, its dose and duration i'll go with that yeah uh, it's just uh, two 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 three things uh, so when we do the cytogenetics and fish uh, particularly these cases ngs is extremely important because honestly last uh, say uh, six eight months i'm started doing uh, ngs very regularly in mds patients and most of the times i'm getting surprises with the new new mutations different combinations and probably these are the extremely important in the prognostic point of view so if there is no 17p deletion in the background and the deletion 5q is clear cut then lenalidomide is a fantastic choice to start with the lenalidomide will be good 10 mg once a day 21 days and in seven days gap to continue like this Uh, i think 2 to 3 months of the length can give you that around 60 to 70% response rate uh, and honestly speaking if there is no uh, though there is a loss of response with the erythropoietin agent stimulating agent so i want to continue the erythropoietin stimulating agent if the patient is on erythropoietin mane esa 40000 i think i switch the esa to darbopoietin uh, 500 uh, three weekly that is our that is my practice also most most of the times we do darbopoietin 500 uh, three weekly so combination will be darbopoietin uh, 503 weekly with the len len combination i'll try uh, dose and duration again is extremely important if the patient responded with any particular therapy of the low risk mds there is no point in stopping the drug you have to continue the drug and that is the main challenge when the patient responded every time he ask you that i am completely doing well my hemoglobin is now 11 12 now what you are treating me so you have to convince them and you have to continue the treatment with the proper doses because that is the extremely important challenge sure and sure most, most important thing is that what we are discussing that uh, if the, the if there is any ngs panel there is some other mutations in the background that to be also to be taken care of very seriously uh, isolated 5q good disease to have but isolated 5q along with something else or something bad mutations in the background your response with the len may not be that much great so these messages to go to the patient's relative or patient to the very first day before starting the treatment plan sure sure thanks thanks anil uh, dr karuna is there yes sir hi 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 karuna any uh, uh, any concerns when we uh, uh, we start uh, darbiprotein along with lenalidomide sanil so in combination of this so do you have anything when we have this uh, when we are combining this lenalidomide and darbiprotein 500 microgram we will be a bit concerned or it will be okay with the so the ther theoretical risk of thrombosis with uh, darbiprotein but uh, usually we see with uh, increase in hemoglobin but as this patient has not responded and so far tolerating it well uh, i think uh, we can combine uh, with uh, sure. lenalidomide in this case and uh, observe uh, the patient sure sure uh, sure so uh, yeah theoretical risk low risk uh, low dose lenalidomide with darbopoietin although there is uh, both thrombosis although this he has uh, thrombocytosis initially and uh, lenalidomide pro thrombotic so uh, in this case i'm just asking for a um, routine or day to day practice will you add ecosprin in this cases when you are combining lenalidomide and this question is to everyone uh, uh, anybody can chip in uh, lenalidomide with darbiprotein alpha and low risk mds uh, will you be adding ecosprin raj actually if you see no theoretically there is a risk of the thromboembolism with the darbiprotein but i am using darbiprotein right and left for last two years 
I have not encountered a single patient of the thromboembolism with the dabutuatin. There is no recommendation to give ecosphirin either. So we, if we think about the venous thromboembolism, then whether to add ecosphirin 75 will do any help to the patient? I don't think so. So in my practice, I don't use that. Uh, anybody oh. else? Has anything? Yeah, Doctor Raya. Is is my, this is uh, Doctor Chirag Shah. Hi, hi, Chirag. Welcome, hi. welcome. Yes. So. Um, uh, short answer, I don't add it in my practice, uh, Ecospring. Now, when we do we it... We are specific, I mean, I'm asking is uh, uh, Darbo protein uh, 500 uh, with uh, linalidomide, whether Ecospring will be, should be added or let it go. Yeah, so I don't add it. Um, the, uh, you know, I, I understand the, the risk is there in terms of the studies, but uh, whether it warrants a routine use of aspirin, uh, that I I don't think it is uh, recommended as a routine because the uh, if you are not targeting very high hemoglobin, then that risk is low. And as the previous uh, panelists have also alluded, that the target hemoglobin is around 10 or whatever keeps patient comfortable. So there are patients who are very comfortable with eight gram for their routine activities and we target that level also. So practically I don't add uh, for this low dose linalidomide. The other analogy you can take is from the myeloma maintenance where we give 10 milligram linalidomide. We at least don't continue uh, ecosprin on that for very long term. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chirag. Anybody else has any views? I'll just move forward. Okay, so uh, this has been covered by Sir. And uh, now again, coming to back to the case. Uh, after the two years, she presents to clinic with epistaxis and particular rash. CBC now shows eight hemoglobin of 8, TLC 2100 and the platelet 35,000, MCB 98. Now she requires packed cell transfusion along with platelet transfusion. Now her serum ferritin has increased to 2,500. Repeat bone marrow has been done. Reveals MDS with multi-lineage dysplasia. And now the molecular studies now reveal TP53 analogy. So uh, uh, taking the case forward, uh, yeah. Dr. Pumpa, I'll come back to you. Uh, how you take this forward? Now she has turned into multi-lineage dysplasia and now she has got... Uh, yes, what is her age? Now she was 60 when she pressed started. Now she is 62. Right. So we have a TP53 abnormality over here, which definitely is a warning for us that the patient is going to progress towards AMR in, uh, in a short period. But uh, having said that, now it has come to the high risk category with the TP53 mutation. But still, I would say that when the transplant, if you look at the transplant data, patients with TP53 abnormality, when they are taken up for transplant, even the chances of relapses are high. So we need to discuss uh, with this patient, though she is low risk, but having a very high risk mutation and the chances of progression to AML is high. And the best option among all of them might be transplant, but again, it comes with the chance of relapse after going through such a tedious uh, transplant uh, uh, procedure. First, I would uh, uh, think of even adding the growth factors over here to have some maintenance, but then you have to discuss definitely with the patient regarding the options available. So we are now uh, moving towards the high risk uh, uh, category. So uh, specific question, whether you used uh, TPO agonist, sir, discussed shortly uh, in his yes, talk. Yes, TPO agonist, romeplostim and l pack both are uh, there which can be used and the dosages are also quite high. It is 150 to 300, they say, for the l pack, but maximum we have gone up to 150 mg once daily. And the other one is romeplostim, even the dosage over there is also 750 microgram once weekly. So both of them are there, but with romiplostim data says that the risk of progression to leukemias or AML is higher, which is relatively less, though no head-to-head -head comparison trial between the two agents. So I preferably would uh, go for l pack for this patient so that she is comfortable taking the drug at home or else even uh, whichever option and whichever is cheaper for the patient or affordability issues are there, accordingly the patient may go on. So, uh, Dr. Samir, coming back to you, uh, 
now patient is now going towards high risk and it's got uh, tp53 uh, anything which you will do before prior to transplant here or directly you will proceed for the transplant counseling and go for the transplant in view of just tp53 mutation yeah so basically uh, i mean if i look at overall one was the ferritin which was high so probably some chelation yeah. there is actually looking for transplant uh, TP53, the other thing would be a blast percentage as well, to see what the blast percentage is, although I'm assuming it's less than 5% still, probably, although you said multilineous dysplasia, especially for hypomethylating agents, use or not. Uh, the, the other thing was the, I think there's, regarding the TP53 mutation itself, I think the zygosity, uh, probably of the mutation, because I think if it's a, a, a sort of biallelic uh, then I think that as you know, the response rates even after transplant are going to be very, very low. I think so. Uh, plus other mutations as well, uh, along with the P53 mutation, if there are more complex karyotypes uh, and things like that. Uh, so in that case, then we have to decide whether we have to go straight for a transplant or use hypomethylating agents before and then go for a transplant. So I think those, uh, those will figure in, uh, uh, at the time of uh, discussions before going into the transfer. Sure, 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 sure. Those are the things I would think of. Obviously, donor selection and things will follow, uh, but uh, that is what I would think, yeah. Sure. So, uh, taking the case uh, predicts uh, TP53, is a disease progression and uh, should be taken into the account. Now, uh, She's not responding to a cell in allodomide, TP organist, and uh, transfusion. Uh, she's being managed, and the talk of transplant is going on, and uh, uh, serum ferritin has been rising. Uh, so, uh, view, how about the chelation? You just talked about chelation, uh, Samir. So just I'll take to uh, Karuna, Dr. Karuna. Uh, uh, role of chelation in a uh, little bit higher risk, not say towards working. Will you, will you use here? Uh, your chelation therapy, or you have just specifically put this chelation for the low risk MDS? Definitely here, yeah, because serum ferritin being 3000 nanogram, I think it's an indication for uh, chelation here. I definitely use uh, chelation therapy in this patient. And uh, I think uh, at this point, so we should. Uh, uh, she has not tried hypomethylating agent, right? Uh, this no, patient. at present, till now, yeah. we have not reached okay. there. Yeah. I think being high risk MDS and uh, you know it's an ideal time to start a hypomethylating agent. As 60 year old, I don't think she's a candidate for transplant here. So I would start chelation. Uh, that, will be, that will be uh, that will that will be little bit yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll okay. come to that. Yeah. Okay, maybe fit yeah. Maybe fit maybe <laughs> yes. I don't. Know. But 60 year per se, uh, we have, we don't know the status of the patient, performance status, and other comorbidities here. So uh, hypomethylating agent plus chelation yes in this patient. In this patient, and any specific choice for chelation, and you uh, you will have this. Any specifically, you will uh, have uh, whether you will be using a spindra or you will be going for IV. Anything specific? Any any dosing schedule? You will prefer because of here. feasibility and convenience. I would be using deferisirox in this patient. Okay. Uh, so uh, this has been covered. Ferritin, we know. Okay. So coming uh, back to uh, Dr. Chira. So yeah. uh, this uh, patient has uh, now multi-lineage dysplasia, MDS. So uh, before going for transplant, everybody wants to avoid as uh, our uh, doctor said, I don't know about transplant. So everyone, patient also says, uh, if I can avoid transplant. So uh, I want anything else. So the role of ATG and as a cytidine in the patient who has just gone into the low risk from low risk to moving towards high risk MDS, uh, 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 what will you take? ATG as a cytidine, how will you take forward this? So uh, ATG, we use very, very sparingly for the MDS patients uh, with uh, uh, specifically hypoplastic MDS patients is where I consider it more often. Uh, not this type of patient. Also uh, comparatively younger patient. And uh, the data says that if you have a PNH clone, then you are likely to have a higher response. Uh, so put together, this is not the patient I would consider for ATG. Um, as a cytidine, this is the 
standard case uh, a typical multi lineage dysplasia um, and uh, uh, you know not responding to the other available options so azacitidine is proven to improve survival significantly in the uh, patients who are high risk category and so the, uh, the 75 mg per meter square once a day for 7 days every month this is the standard protocol we use uh, for some elderly patients there is uh, data and we have tried that also that you can start or you can just continue even with lower frequency means instead of 7 days you can do 5 days or even sometimes 3 days uh, of azacitidine uh, and that may work so if patient has issues tolerating uh, developing lot of cytopenias then even a 5 days uh, can be tried so i would use azacitidine in this patient okay. sure sure thank you thank you dr chirag so uh, moving forward i'll just skip this uh... okay so uh... coming to this uh, so we will come Dr. to the Dinas, uh, just just an input uh, there is some data regarding a patient uh, of mds with ep53 low risk cases uh, desitabin has been shown to have some sort of advantage as compared to azacitidine it uh, it was just there in ash 2020 so uh, i don't know the inputs from other uh, panelists here but this is what i came across that if a tp53 mutation is there desitabin seems to work a little bit a bit better than asa yeah uh, i uh, had an opportunity to talk to asin kulashekar raj who is a, a colleague of dr gulam mufti and he also told that data has been presented with the desitabin working for a p53 mutations but there are a, conflicting data from the other literature is also so we can't take that the p53 mutation uh, uh, the desitabin is very good uh, we can't say that because there, there are conflicting data there are data reported for the p53 the desitabin is working but there are conflicting data also that it is not working so choices can be because it has been proved yeah. that overall survival is improved less than 65 years associated in is better so still we can consider that as also probably as siraj told i will go for the uh, the the low dose in fact i will uh, i will straight away take the consider for the patient for straight away taking up for the transplantations without giving anything just yes, the transfusion yes, yes, support yes. with iron chelators yeah because so, he is uh, not having any blastocyst cellular marrow so yeah so that was the uh, basically the idea whether we will in this particular case when it's being transformed from low risk and it's uh, going to dysplasia whether we should be directly taking for transplant or counseling the patient for transplant or you will give as a cytidine and followed by transplant so a uh, conflicting I, uh, I, i will consider for the transplant uh, by bridging time if there is undue delay even then because the cytopenia the, the hypomethylating induced hma induced cytopenia will further require admissions and complications of infections so probably the patient is because it might have been uh, initiated the a uh, donor transplant at the time of diagnosis for the long term curative potential so probably we can we can straight away think about it straight away yeah uh, this is my take anybody else in this say whether you will be using as a cytidine or desitabine in uh, the patient who have been uh, uh, gone from low risk to high risk uh, uh, category uh, use of as a cytidine or desitabine prior to transplant or directly taking them to transplant anyone I, anyone can i actually. think uh, i agree with the uh, directly going to transplant approach uh since there is no additional advantage of uh, uh, improving the cytopenias before transplant so as long as the blast is less than 5% uh if it was between 5 and 10 there may be some debate i'll come to that <laughs> uh, dr chirag so how, yeah. how how much you will give the survival advantage 62 year old lady directly for the transplant Who is going right. having TP fifty three? What will be the percentage you will telling to the patients right. relatives right. that uh, so outcome will be a, right? No, I think so. This is a uh, you know if the my answer was to the question of uh, once the transplant decision has been taken, then there is no point of giving as a side in prior to transplant. Now whether to go for transplant or not. 
is a very big question in this and in general uh, i would weigh the transplant option much much lower in a tp53 mutated patient age 62 uh, put together uh, by you know these two factors unless she is uh, you know mira bai chanu who is now turned 62 you know some very athletic uh, very fit woman uh, who has uh, developed this uh, then lo would be an important discussion point yes the the pros and cons will be discussed because the only curative option is transplant so if there are patients who would be willing to go for that and take that chance the to give the number i would say that for tp53 the long term i would say about 10% 10% and i suppose transplant you are not giving transplant what will be our choices doctor chirag what you will be say what how you will manage this case so as a cytidine um and as a cytidine has a um i you know the exact numbers i don't remember from that study but uh, about one and a half year of median survival uh, so some people can go even much longer so there is you know if they the good thing is that with azacitidine tp53 is not a prognostic factor unlike for transplant where it is a prognostic factor so if this patient um i mean it may so happen i think that the median survival with or without transplant might be actually same with the only uh, attraction of transplant being that the 10% might get cured uh, sure sure thanks thanks uh, dr chirag so uh uh i'll just move forward to second case uh, i will take it a little uh, early this is 65 year old male uh, history of hypertension presents at emergency department with uh, progressive fatigue and shortness of breath since one month and this uh, evaluation hemoglobin of 7 tlc count of 1250 platelet of 30000 nc 400 mcv of 110 rest of the parameters kftl of tld was normal ecg echo was normal ferritin 124 b12 300 folic acid more than 20 bone marrow aspirated biopsy revealed hypercellular bone marrow with 13% myeloblast and moderate reticular fibrosis actogenetics was uh, 46 uh, normal internal metaphases deletion 7 and 5 metaphases and finally reported as mds rbt no actually matched error dr ramaswami your chance now how you will approach this case high risk mds no actually oh, uh, matched and so definitely uh, definitely there is a more than 10% blast so for the better outcome post transplant you need to the cytoreductive agent is required and being a 65 year 65 year old and uh, probably the studies have shown that there is no intensive chemotherapy as well as this one and uh, i will go for the because i especially deletion 7p tolerating the chemotherapy will be difficult in a mds patient so i will go for the hypomethylating agent as a choice and uh, with available reports azacitidine is having a edge over the zistabine i will consider the azacitidine and a conventional 7 days course of 75 mg per meter squared or 5 plus 5 plus 2 will be the choice and then give it of a minimum of 2 uh, to 4 cycles and as soon as possible i need to go for the transplant if i get the response so probably uh, if i am able to do the bone marrow at the end of 2 cycles if i am getting it probably i will consider immediately probably if i am not then i will go for the four cycles provided the counts are stabilizing and then it is not deteriorating meanwhile the donor has been searched for it and then we are getting it if he is agreeing for the same thank you uh, uh dr samir can we have you back here your uh, yes, yes absolutely ha uh, ha so so he has no don't have a hla match donor so uh, your right, preference so I, think I, uh, we, i i don't Aplo think aplo versus mud correct you will please i don't think we got much choice here so 65 year old so i think performance uh, status is number 1 uh, to see whether he's fit for transplant in the first place with hsctci scoring and all of that to see what uh, you know what he scores us uh, as uh, Dr. Amos, I mean, clearly said, you know, I would even I would go for at least two cycles of ASA here uh, before we proceed. Now, compared with MUD versus a Haplo, I think I would still prefer a MUD uh, or a Haplo. If I got a good 10 out of 10 matched uh, unrelated donor, I would go for a MUD. Uh, sure. At the minute, 
um, because just because we have got more data with a with a mud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, anything uh, single agent as a cytidine, or whether you will try, try to uh, combine with phenytoclax? I think I'll just stick with single agent as a cytidine. Uh, I think just thirteen percent last seven Q. So, I think I'll just stick with single agent as a cytidine. Sure, 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 sure. So, uh, this I'll. Uh, this was the question again. Uh, uh, Dr. Sanyal, anything specific, whether as a cytidine or decytabine, which one you will prefer more? Seven deletions and deletion in this particular case. So we prefer as a cytidine because it is subcutaneous route, and after cycle one or two, most of the patients can manage at home also. So my preference is always as a cytidine because it is easily can be given at home with subcutaneous tea. And many of our patients manage as a CT at home. So that is why I'm quite comfortable with the CTD. There is no data about ASA over DCT or DC over ASA. Uh, there are some data that uh, intravenous ASA sometimes works better, but again, it's a very questionable thing. So my choice will be as a CTD, but yes, I agree with uh, you, Raj. I'd probably add ASA with venetoclax here if the patient can afford. If the patient can afford, uh, I yeah. will CTD with venetoclax. Okay. Uh, Dr. Karuna, any different views from here? No, sir. I, I agree. Same, sir. I do same in my practice. Okay. So, uh, uh, again, uh, Dr. Priyanka. Hello, Dr. Priyanka. Are, yeah, yeah. I'm there. Yeah. So, so. So, uh, how frequently, what's your cutoff for your cytoreductive therapy? Uh, means patient was having 13% blast. So, taking directly for the transplant or you want a bridging, whether you want as a cytidine and what you, what percentage, suppose the patient presented after two cycles or four cycles, you say it's still 8%. Uh, will you proceed or you will say, I'll still continue. How, what is your uh, uh, blast percentage limit to be specific? Before you say, okay, I'm okay with the transplant. We know the lesser the um, blast percentage, the better is the better outcome. Is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so but yes. Suppose, yes. So, what is your time range? Exactly. So, uh, suppose uh, we go ahead with the single agent. This patient is having 13% blast. So, single agent as a cytidine should be sufficient enough after two cycles to get the blast percentage in the marrow. If in case it still remains at 8%, uh, when it adding penetoclax to the therapy and one cycle post that again looking at the marrow would be a better option because the more reduction in the blast percentage, the better would be the outcome and the lesser chances of relapse. So this would be my approach. So two cycles you will see and if it is not changing. So uh, Miss, uh, my question was whether, suppose it has not budged 12%, will you give two more cycles or you say no, enough is enough, I will okay, proceed yeah, with the transplant. Yeah, uh, proceeding with the transplant, definitely we have to discuss with the patient and we have to see what, how the performance status is. If there is a little bit time again to go ahead and the patient is not deteriorating, I can think about adding another one month to the uh, bridging therapy. So the lesser the blast, it is always a better uh, outcome post-transplant. So that would be my approach. Sure. So, uh, uh, Dr. Samir, I'll get back to you again. So, uh, what is our uh, post-transplant uh, if the patient uh, your uh, thought process on post-transplant as a cytidine? Just Priyanka said that post-transplant she will be using. So, anything uh, you will have this uh, post-transplant as the cytidine and for how long? So, typically I think most of us for high-risk uh, AMLs and things like that, I think we'll be using azacytidine by default anyway. I think most of us are probably using it. Uh, we lost you, Dr. Uh, I think that would be probably just be the start. Um, I think for how long, I think that will really depend upon, you know, tolerability and cytopenia, chimerism. But I think it, at least for uh, a year, two years, uh, at least uh, to see how they are, how they are getting on. But I think uh, that are we using anyone that, using post transplant uh, uh, as a cytidine here? Anybody in the panel in AML or MDS, uh, high risk MDS or AML? Anybody is using? I don't driven. MRD driven. MRD driven. So, uh, how long you have been using this, uh, Dr. Thompson? 
yeah uh, the thing is most of the time uh, once the mrd is positive we are going to be in the uh, non safe position so at uh, that time we may combine still the dli is our priority but we will try to give the patient the asa plus dli and then first asa course of that five days course and then followed by the dli and then wait for a month or if necessary after 15 days depends upon the gvht symptoms and other things so that is a way we will go for that but most of the time we are using the patient when the mrd is going up even in spite of the, the single dli alone or single or the dla plus asa uh, we didn't find any difference at least my number is limited so there is no difference dr chirag your thought process here um <clears throat> yeah so the you know the first option uh, is dli uh, but many times uh, you know it may be easier to go with azacitidine in terms of the uh, logistics the, the side effects the you know the risk and the cost everything uh, so azacitidine yes i have not used it in maintenance because the Uh, i mean i you know i would like to but the the count wise the tolerative tolerability uh, is very difficult to give post transplant at least in our patient sure sure, sure. Uh, so we have so, a couple of questions post transplant yeah but, dr uh, reyes can i ask a question before we go ahead just uh, uh, from the uh, the risk point of view while discussing with patient uh, loscd in mds uh, in this age group uh, what kind of uh, mortality treatment related would you say for indian setting in with mod or haplo because you know for my understanding uh, mod has been uh, in, a, in this age group 60 plus is quite difficult mod or mod yeah yeah haplo no no still uh, in our center i say haplo no but uh, in mod yes uh, uh, we can have you can say 30% uh, chance that patient will have at least three years of this few patients we have done aml mds type of uh, patients few patients we did by trm uh, almost 30 40% we can be retell this 65 year age is not a good age to do transplant Okay. India, it's tough. Infections, getting cytopenias, it's a tough thing. Thank you. Sure. So uh, this top uh, optimal timing still debatable. Uh, transplant, as we discussed, less than ten percent. Better it will be blast percentage more than it's ten uh, percent associated with high risk of relapse. So, uh, so with this, uh, I'll just uh, close our uh, panel. Rajas. Rajas. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah but for the other we, we for, for the audience purpose so we had a discussion that most of our panelists are confining to the azacitide and uh, definitely adding veritoclox will be useful and uh, it does double the the response rate and uh, same thing is replicable as like that of the aml to the mds also so it can be considered only then the toxicity profile has to be considered the tolerance of fragility Consider. of the patient yes. has yes. to be kept in mind so if possible available better to combine with the combinations and then the for 14 days instead of 21 or 28 days 14 days is enough yeah. then seeing that and then we can decide yeah according to the patient profile yes Absolutely. definitely do 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 agree sure thank you thank you with this i just close the uh, panel discussion and get back to the uh, organizers thank you rayas for conducting that panel discussion so beautifully and thanks to all the thank panel. you sir we got couple of questions lying in the question box first question is from dr manoj on which group of patients do you consider immuno stimulatory agents anybody wants to take it up immuno modulatory agents in mds atg cyclosporine etc so i think this got discussed younger okay. people uh, females uh, those who have hypoplastic mds chirag mentioned that then if you got a pnh clone you got trisomy 8 then uh, these are the people who probably uh, respond better uh, in the center of the whole thing is the hypoplastic mds vishnu prashad asks wants to know can loose percept be used in dialysis uh, in patients on dialysis and yeah, that's the first part of the question can loose percept be used in patients who are on dialysis anybody 
Okay, so lusmatercept is not nephrotoxic. It can be used in patients who have got renal failure or who are on dialysis. The second part of the question is, what will be the choice of your chelation if the patient is on dialysis? Anybody? So the answer is that D-ferrocerox is the only one which you will not use, but uh, the remaining two agents, depending on the choice of the person, whether he wants oral or injectable, you can go for the remaining two, which are not uh, nephrotoxic. Last question is by Dr. Ashwarya Raj. Haplotransplant outcome in 50-year-old female with MDS with persistent monosomy 7, despite six cycles of decitable. Anybody? Uh, uh, patient has to go for the transplant, no other options, but the, if the blast percentage is being reduced, if they are able to do the mutation studies and look for the other adverse effect mutations, keeping those things in the mind, if the patient is fit enough, comorbidities are nil, I think we should go for that. Monosomy per se will not that much effective post-transplant, but the adverse mutations will have an impact, like P53 starting that. Thank you. Anybody wants to add anything on any aspect of MDS management? Otherwise, we will close this session. If none, then I hand over to Mr. Abhishek Bhavsar for the vote of thanks. Thank you. So I think uh, I will not take much time. I just wanted to thank uh, everyone who was part of uh, today's evening's program. And uh, we will, as I said, we will continue to conduct more such scientific forums and events. Thank you very much once again for uh, taking your time out for this event. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Agrawal. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Abhishek, for supporting the academic activity. And thanks to all, one and all, who are present over here. Bye-bye. Good night. Everyone. Good night to all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.